Hi, I'm Rachel from Get Through. We provide the best in class peer to peer calling and texting tools, and we're proud to be a sponsor of this year's nonprofit technology conference. We've worked with thousands of organizations to send more than a billion messages since 2016. Get Through provides through text, which facilitates one to one text conversations at scale. We also provide through talk, the only dialer of its kind that can call cell phones legally. If you'd like to learn more about how to scale up your support or contact for fundraising, events, and more, check us out at getthrough.io or send us a note at info at getthrough.io. What I'm passionate about is changing the status quo. We are an integration platform as a service that is dedicated solely to the nonprofit sector. We understand the vernacular and the terminology, and more importantly, the workflows of the nonprofits. The vision at Omatic is to integrate all nonprofit technology and democratize data access and insights for all nonprofits. Set data free. <laughs> if your mission is the eradication of some horrible disease, wouldn't it be wonderful if you actually worked yourself out of a job? I do believe that we have made significant progress in this country, don't get me wrong, but it would be amazing to work for an organization that was for a cause where they won. We ready to get started? Trees may look like solitary individuals, but the ground beneath our feet tells a different story. Trees are secretly talking, trading, and waging war on one another. They do this using a network of fungi that grow around and inside their roots. The fungi provide the trees with nutrients and in return they receive sugars. But scientists have found this connection runs far deeper than first thought. By plugging into the fungal network, trees can share resources with each other. The system has been nicknamed the Wood Wide Web. It's thought that older trees, fondly known as mother trees, use this fungal network to supply shaded seedlings with sugars, giving them a better chance of survival. Those trees that are sick or dying may dump their resources into the network, which might then be used by healthier neighbours. Plants also use fungi to send messages to one another. If they're attacked, they can release chemical signals through their roots, which can warn their neighbours to raise their defences. 
But like our internet, the wood wide web has its dark side too. Some orchids hack the system to steal resources from nearby trees. And other species, like the black walnut, spread toxic chemicals through the network to sabotage their rivals. Our boreal cybercrime aside, scientists are still debating why plants seem to behave in such an altruistic way. The hidden network creates a thriving community between individuals. When you're next in Woodland, you might like to think of trees as part of a big super organism, chatting and swapping information and food under your feet. All right. Oh, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to get started. If you meant to learn about team care this morning, then you are in the right place. Welcome, NT Sears. Good morning, Pacific Coasters. Good day to our East Coasters. Ty, hopefully you can see this. I think we're on a five second delay with our audience. But anyway, Ty, are you there? Oh, no, I hope it's season and I'm ready to go. I'm excited. Excellent. Excellent. So I can hear you. I can't um, hang out with Ty as much these days, but we get to hang out on trainings. And, you know, these days are tough. You all are here because you know the specific tensions and anxieties that we face in the nonprofit sector. We already had regular nonprofit anxiety of changing the world, but then you add a pandemic on top of that. And then, you know, last year was a pretty high profile election year. For those of us who've been doing work for decades, this was a big one. For those of us just waking up to the political system, this was a big one. There's a few more balls that we start adding on, right? Seasonal depression in the winter. Uh, I've been petrified about global warming since reading Bill McKibben's The End of Nature in 1993. There's the existential dread that all of us feel on a regular basis. And then we have more. Ty uh, and I are worried about losing coworkers. We have to go back to school now and there's school shootings and supermarket shootings and all kinds of shootings. There's a lot of balls that we're juggling. And when we want to, we can work ourselves up into a, a tizzy, as my mom would say. But then Ty, what do we have to do? Susan, that those uh, slides usually always just stress me out, right? And I always tell you, stop. You have to stop and breathe and orchestrate these mindful moments. That is why we are here today. We know you all are juggling a lot of balls right now. And sometimes you feel like that cartoon. But today we want to talk about your self-care and your team care. So be here with us right now to learn new ways. This is one of my favorite quotes, Resma Menachem. It says, in order for someone to do this work, this trauma work, he or she must first learn to slow down, slow everything down. Observe your body. How are you feeling inside, outside? What's happening? And allow it to settle. We're going to give you some tools today to help you in those moments when things are feeling worked up. You're juggling too much, too many balls. How can I stop and orchestrate those mindful moments? Because a settled body helps the other bodies it encounters to settle as well. So I'm excited to be here with you all today, and hopefully this quote resonated with you. And we will introduce ourselves. Uh, we promise to tell you more about our backgrounds, but we also wanted to just kind of like do an exercise right away, you know, bringing up all of this stress. Maybe you feel it in your body. We're going to talk more about this tree metaphor and explain why we showed that tree video. But first, you know, actually, I'm going to have um, Ty take you through this. I'm going to demonstrate standing. And uh, this, is a, this is a grounding exercise. This is something we can all do together. Hopefully you'll do it. We can't see you, but go ahead and stand or sit. And, you know, Ty, why don't you take them through the five, four, three, two, one. Absolutely, Susan. Again, this is a very simple grounding. It gets you grounded, gets you present, lets you recognize the things around you. So I want you to look at this screen or look around you and find five things that you can see around you. As you're looking, grounding exercises, again, help you uh, bring you present as well as help you with any anxiety, any stressors that you're having, just bringing you present in the moment. Five things you see. I have a lovely view right now of some trees, some birds. It's springtime. Now let's keep going with that. What are four things that you can physically touch around you? And I want you to reach out and actually touch them. 
bringing yourself present to where you are. Taking deep breaths as you're doing that. Now three things that you hear. Yes, my voice may be one. Your self-breathing may be another. But really tune in. What do you hear? Three things. We're going to keep going with that. What are two things you smell right now? I don't know why sometimes when I do this, when I have to close my eyes, you know, just to see what I can smell. I'm not sure why that happens. Just a reflex. And then one thing you can taste. Usually when we do these sessions, I usually taste coffee. How about you? I've got some tea going. My coffee chapter is over, but on the West Coast, you know, they have good coffee. So again, I, I like this grounding exercise. Not only does it help me with stress, anxiety, it also gives me that appreciation, that appreciation for the things around me, but the appreciation for the moment right now that we're in. So with that being said, let me go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Taisha or Ty Powell. I'm a native Baltimorean. I've been an educator, a former athletic coach, a fitness and wellness coach. I am a questioner. Um, it drives some people crazy, but I ask a lot, a lot of questioners. Uh, I, I ask a lot, a lot of questions. I'm sorry. But those questions have, have led me through to this work that Susan and I are doing now, questioning how we are handling our stress, how we are handling our anxiety. I'm currently working on my dissertation um, that's uh, on the topic of whole leaders create whole schools questioning how leaders are dealing with their own mental, emotional, physical wellness. I'm passionate about team wellness as well. And I am on this journey of self-growth, teaching others how to show love as well as sow love into others. So I'm excited to be here with you today and I can't wait to dig into our material. I'm going to pass it over to Susan. Awesome. Thank you, Ty. I am also from Baltimore. Ty and I have that and lots of things in common. Um, but my journey was through the nonprofit world. I've spent over 27 years from college activism on doing nonprofit work, campaign work, advocacy work, fundraising work, lots of deadlines, lots of stress, a lot of it self-induced. And, you know, yoga kind of kept me marginally sane throughout the years and really doing a lot of dietary stuff to keep my body healthy. Uh, but I never really learned wellness stuff at work, even though we were super stressed out and maybe I wasn't the best boss all of the time. And yet I really depended on these practices. So when uh, three years ago, when we started nonprofit wellness and comfort consulting, I wanted to focus on wellness for the nonprofit world. And when I met Taisha and we bonded about this work in the education community as well, we knew we needed to pilot it. Uh, we did a, a nonprofit pilot called the Wellness Equity Pilot. The report's on our website. Check it out. Now we're doing an education pilot to bring this to teachers, K-12 teachers. And really our approach is team care, not just self-care. Everybody says self-care, self-care. Guess what? We're terrible at self-care in the nonprofit and the education world. Ty mentioned that she's a questioner. I'm what Gretchen Rubin calls an obliger. This is the four tendencies framework. I'm really good at like external goals, but not so good at my own goals. So guess what? That means I'm terrible at self-care. And I bet that there's some more of you obligers out there in the nonprofit world, in the education world, selfless folks. And so, you know, when we talk about our tree of self-care, of well-being, we're really talking about the roots of self-care and team care, like how your roots interconnect, just like that video showed us a few minutes ago. How do your roots interconnect with others on your team? And that could be your family team, that could be your work team, that could be your friend or coworker team. And you've got to figure out what gives you the nourishment you need, but you can also support your team, turn your superpower of caring for other people on your coworkers so that you can all lift each other up and bring your best physical and mental selves to the work. 
Um, so our goals for today are to go over those roots of self-care and team care. We said we'd go over the stressor scorecard, but actually we're gonna save that for another session. Those resilience practices take a little longer than what we have today, but we're gonna make it up to you by doing three different tools with the, the roots of self-care and team care. We're gonna go over the personal stress prescription, the immune boosters, and uh, brain boost breaks and give you uh, a bunch of tools that you can use with your teams. And we'll use the plus delta sort of framework um, to examine your habit change, to examine like how it is you bring your values to your wellness. So those are our goals for today. Um, and just to kick us off, some of you have shared where you are coming from, literally, physically, geographically in the chat. Now we'd like you to share another thing in the chat. So Ty, tell them about this piece that we want to know from them. So we love adding interactions throughout our sessions. Sometimes we use chat box, polls if we're in Zoom, brain breaks, icebreakers, various different interactions. These are also tools that you could take when you're leading meetings with your organization and your teams. I mean, just I, actually, it's a way to just check in with yourself too. How do you like to move your body? Start to put that in the chat for, for me right now. How do you like to move your body? This is also one of those things where you're showing a pre Initiative inquiry. Your in, inquiry. Sorry, um, you're asking yourself, "Hey, what's the positive things that I like about how I move my body? What are those type of things?" So put it in the chat, chat away. Let us know how you move today. I haven't gotten a lot of movement today, Susan, but I cannot wait to go get on the bike tonight. We got a lot of runners in the group. There's some Tai Chi, some more yoga, some folks that are open and vulnerable, saying they don't move their body. Um, some people are tossing discs, uh, cycling, dance parties with kindergartners, wiggles with toddlers. You know, um, I have a dog in the house at the moment doing sleepovers, Ty, so I'm getting a lot of walks with the dog. Some other folks are walking their dogs. We have some great suggestions of specific workouts in the chat, so check those out. And also just to sort of let meta facilitate, like you all are bonding over some of the things in the chat box, right? You're seeing your interests reflected in this little family that we have here at this training today. This is the same kind of thing you can do with your group, your team. You say what people, ask how people like to move their body. Well, people love talking about themselves and so they take that opportunity and then guess what? Find commonalities, right Ty? We've seen some good ones come up. I've actually seen some that I haven't seen, some virtual reality ping pong. That's interesting. I want to look that one up. I love how uh, one person said joyful movement, right? Because that's the idea is to just move your body in a way that brings you joy. And, you know, that might be an intimate private way. That might be a public way. That It might be a way that you share with others. But the point is you're moving your body. Exactly. And while that takes us to a great point, Susan, I want to make sure we let everyone know a few definitions. We're going to use the words physical health and wellness often today. And when we're talking about physical health, we want you to know that we're talking about the awareness and care of your overall body, not just the movement, but how are you feeding your body? How are you hydrating your body? How are you uh, recovering those so that awareness and care of our body? And then when we talk about wellness, that's overall. How are you using your physical health and mental health, that overall wellness to bridge that overall wellness that's comfortable for you, that's accessible to you, and that works for you. This is your journey. So Susan's going to get into a little bit more of how these pieces work together for you overall. Yeah. And so when people talk about wellness, generally what jumps to mind is that red circle, that physical health, right? How do we move our bodies? What do we feed our bodies? How much sleep are you getting? Is it good quality sleep? Like that's your physical corpus, your soma. That's the Greek word for body. So somatic, anything just has to do with your body. But of course, mental health is absolutely related to your physical health and it's distinct from your physical health. And, you know, when we at Nonprofit Wellness talk about mental health, it's everything, not just sort of the negative parts of like depression or addiction, uh, but also 
the the positive things or the double-edged things like around friendship or spirituality or money or family right and these are things that affect our mental health um, and that are related to our physical health but also a little taboo they're not as accepted that we talk about these things at work certainly some things are more taboo than others and some things are downright encouraged happy hour let's go drinking like we actually proactively sort of do destructive things <laughs> and and then don't talk about some of the really proactive constructive things that we should but our model here is that red and blue make purple if we talk about our physical and our mental health with each other we're going to have stronger team health we're going to have more open communication because look we were just vulnerable with each other about our bodies like how much more intimate can that get but also that vulnerability inspires empathy. I go, oh, so-and-so also is, is gluten-free or has irritable bowel syndrome that I can bond with them about that. Um, and then you get into deeper conversations, right? Without hopefully being inappropriate or um, not being safe or holding people's safety at work. And that's where people shy away from mental health discussions. They don't wanna be unsafe for themselves or others. So some, so one of our tips, um, you know, in this work is to, like Ty said, start with appreciative inquiry. We asked you how you like to move your body. That's necessarily something you like. It's positive and how you move your body, something that's already happening. We, we helped you identify a core competency, an existing habit or a strength you already have. These are easiest to continue. Hopefully everybody that took, typed mowing the lawn and, you know, getting their wiggles out with their kindergartner are going to go do that again again today or tomorrow. These are easy to keep doing. But then you want to nudge, right? You want that constructive change to happen. So then we go, well, what could we dream for the future? Or what do we need to delete, right, to make room for something new? And sometimes it's not the obvious things. And so we want to introduce you to uh, the personal stress prescription, which is another way that you personally, the I, can make changes, but also going to that team level, the we, how you can support others in their changes and how you can you know, build in accountability for those of us like obligers who aren't so great at accountability. And also we have like a collaborative chat going on. So I hope that folks are um, you know, putting some resources in the chat. Our friend Jesse is um, also putting some things that we mentioned, like if we could put Gretchen Rubin's four tendencies in there, some folks might be interested in that. Appreciative inquiry, there's tons of you know information online if you're interested in delving a little deeper there. But uh, Ty, should we talk about the prescription? Yes, Susan, I always love these sessions where we're you know, it, it's kind of like you're the resource dig or like a resource list and we're giving people, it, it's starting to percolate in their brains a little bit. Oh, I could do this. I can add this. And this is one of the tools that we want to introduce them to. I love this tool because it forces me to look inward, check in on me. It's a self-prescription tool for stress management, management because only you can decide what it is that calms your body. I personally keep updating this tool for myself because there are things in my life that I need to increase. There's are thing, things in my life that I need to decrease. So this tool gives me a list. And again, there are tons of things, tons of things that you could put on this list. We found the research base and tried and true things and put it on this list and say, hey, where are the areas of my life when it comes to my own stress management that I need to increase to get more of? Maybe that's gratitude. Maybe that's more you know, eating green leafy vegetables. And where are the things that I need to de decrease? Sometimes it's, hey, I need to decrease my news intake, you know, maybe watching it only in the morning or listening on a drive. How can I balance that, find those balancing, that balancing act with this tool that helps with my stress management? So again, a powerful tool to use, a powerful resource. Susan has placed, or Jesse has placed the link in, in the chat to allow you to download this tool. Yeah, and we also, um, también es disponible en español. Um, a lot of our tools we have in Spanish and English, partially because of the constituencies that we serve, but also because it's a fun way to improve your Spanish. So um, I know from doing this work and starting to do bilingual trainings, my Spanish has certainly improved. And we have um, videos too 
that are in Spanish or subtitled on our YouTube channel. So we encourage you to take advantage of those resources in both languages. And, uh, you know, when talking about mental health, for example, or physical health, it's more safe to talk about it in your native language. And so even if people can, you know, communicate in a second language, like it's great to, again, team care, like uh, be as culturally responsive as we can be. So we would love to have you all self-medicate and we want you to put in the chat some things that you would like to increase or decrease. But we also want to just self-medicate together. And I don't mean taking shots, although this term has come to mean like alcohol things. <laughs> I mean breathing. So everybody just take a deep breath wherever you are right now. Remember, we have to engineer these mindful moments for ourselves. No one tells you to breathe. Well, I just did, but you know, we do it automatically. And uh, actually another pop quiz, I don't, I, um, some folks are putting some, some resolutions in the chat box. Another uh, pop quiz, how many breaths do we take in a day? I don't know if anyone has counted. I have not yet made it through an entire day of counting, but I've read some articles. And so if anyone has a guess, put it in the chat box. The thing that I'll also say about this self-medication of breathing is that you can hack it. When you lengthen your inhalation or your exhalation, you either bring energy or bring relaxation, bring stimulation or relaxation right to your body based on how you breathe. So it's pranayama and the yoga practice, right? The, the management of our breath is the management of our chi, of our energy. And so again, take another deep breath. As we inhale, we're bringing in oxygen, just the opposite of trees, actually, because they're photosynthesizing with the carbon dioxide, creating sugars and, and exhaling oxygen. We're doing the opposite. And if you want to, again, hack your breathing, which is the language of your nervous system, you practice these things and you inhale and exhale with different rhythms so that you can notice the imprint and the impact on your body. So other self prescriptions, um, uh, a lot of folks are digging, digging what someone shared about being more mindful and not more mind space full, right? You're having your mind be full, that monkey mind. And we do have to work on it every day. I don't see any guesses yet of uh, how many, oh wait, there's a lot in the chat box. Um, how many guesses? Oh yeah, so just, <laughs> somebody said at least 25. Another person said 6,000. Jesse guessed 10,000. You're on the right track. I've read 20,000 breaths in a day. I've read 25, I've read 17. So I'm gonna say between 17,000 and 25,000 breaths in a day. So, how many of them can you make more mindful? It's a good challenge. So other prescriptions, self prescriptions, keep them coming in the chat box. So again, when you settle your body, when you are in the moment, when you are paying attention, that is a real gift that we can give other people. And in the nonprofit world and the education world, we're serving other people all the time. And so if our mindfulness can embrace those we love, they will bloom like flowers, says Tich Nhat Hanh. Tay Tuesday, it's sort of, it's Thursday, Tay Thursday. So Ty, I'm sorry, you were supposed to go over the Tich Nhat Hanh quote. Anything else you wanna say about my beautiful photo? No, but I, I do like these moments where we can stop. You do this for me a lot. You'll send some quotes or you'll send a meme. And it's it, it's also a mindfulness technique. One, stop, read the quote, let it resonate. But it's a minute to stop, breathe, and take it in. So again, this is a tool that you can use with your team, orchestrating those moments within your meetings. But it's also something you can use for yourself, whether it's putting up quotes around your home, around your desk, to encourage yourself to stop, breathe, retake those quotes in, take those words in. These are all mindfulness techniques. Quick plug, we actually do, uh, I love US Postal Service, and so we print postcards with um, English wellness phrases and some original Spanish wellness phrases. So if you wanna order some postcards or have them sent to someone, you can go on our website and do the, under the blog cards link and send someone a postcard 
with either an English or a Spanish phrase and have them pause and hopefully take a breath in their day. So remember we talked uh, we talked about physical wellness, not just being your physical movement, but also what you're putting into your body, how you're moving your body physically or some of the actions. How What are you feeding your body mentally and physically? So this is immune booster list. It's actually an updated list that our interns or MPH students help research this list for us and come up with this science back list of things that will help boost your immune system. This is a great list. And I, I think Susan and I go back and forth going across and say, hey, which one of these haven't I done? Let me send Ty a joke today, you know, to make her laugh because laughter actually builds the immune system. So these are things that ha will help you. Again, something you could print out, you could do, you could pick one or two that you like. You could do this with your kids. You could do this amongst your family, amongst your team to, again, build your immunity, but also bring joy, bring the stress levels down as we do some of these things. Yeah, and we're, we'll do another plus and delta model so that you can you know, set some goals for yourself, but also see how you can do it with a team and we're right, creating like a buddy system for some new habits. Um, so again, if you go to resources on our page, we ask that you enter your email and then you'll get a link to our downloads page where you can download any of these things for free in English and Spanish. So the, um, the immune booster one, again, like appreciative inquiry, what for you, and you can share it in the chat or this is share, you know, just private for you. What is an immune boosting strength right now? When you look at this list, you're like, Oh, I do that. I didn't know that was an immunity booster. What's your strength? There's might be something you have mastery of, right? That you're like, I am a master lymphatic massage practitioner. Or I really work to get probiotic foods into my diet. I know all about probiotic foods. Like, what's your strength? And so you maybe can see where this is going with your team. Um, you might want to say where you'd like to make a change. Maybe there's a dietary change you want to make, but as folks noted in the chat, you don't want to always get focused on diet, right? Folks have very different eating strictures and very different issues around food. I would add the same with alcohol, right? When I stopped drinking three years ago, suddenly happy hours were not the fun opportunity to connect with coworkers that they used to be. So we have to be inclusive and tolerant, but also not like always focused on the same thing. So if you would like to make a change, maybe it's movement, maybe it's uh, learning about lymphatic massage, maybe it's playing more or taking up a mindfulness, that positivity brain change practice. Well, so then you can find like who is identifying that as a mastery, like who could mentor you in your mushroom eating practices or your cold shower experiments or your mindfulness practice. Maybe there is some accountability and buddy system there that you could create among your team. Ty and I do this all the time. Um, we even, uh, Ty, I love that you finally got your bike so that you could, um, can fulfill your promise to Gabby to make it to one of her spin classes now that she teaches spin online. That's my favorite, you know, commitment that you made to your habit change and that your and your commitment to Gabby. You and I have to find another similarity. You keep pushing these mushrooms on me. I can't, I can't do it, Susan. I can't. <laughs> they do shiitake jerky now. I had some mush. I had lion's mane mushrooms in my coffee this morning. You don't have to chew the fungus. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> one day, one day, <laughs> maybe. So as we're as we're moving forward and pushing forward, you know, we talk a lot about movement, and it's so many different types of exercise. It's and <laughs> this is one That's of my a great example of your mindfulness. Tell them what just happened. I have my computer uh, yell out to me the every hour as a reminder to get up and actually move. So often we sit at our computers for so long. The timing of this, I couldn't have timed this any better. But 
So often, especially now, we sit at our computers for so long. Our posture sometimes is bad. We're not moving. We're not going to the restroom. We're not eating. So my computer tells me on the hour, you can go change it, click on the time, no matter what type of computer you have. And it'll say it to you out loud. And it's like an alarm for me. I'm from the school systems, everyone. I love those reminders. Uh, so it reminds me to get up and move. So perfect timing. I think we all can do movement. And please remember, no matter where you are, movement is great. Um, Susan and I have recently gotten into more chair postures, chair poses. Susan's going to show some arm extensions. I feel like if you do something long enough, you're going to you're going to feel or get a sweat going, you know, and get the heart rate up. So Susan's going to show you two. I'm going to attempt to show you a, a chair plank from my small position here. Oh, I like it. Well, yeah, just wherever you are, we can't see you. And I've stopped sharing the screen so that we could do a little more demo. But um, just breathe in and let me get in front of my camera and bring your arms up. You can shrug your shoulders up or shrug them down. Um, you're bringing your arms up. This is a yoga pose called Hastasana. And just by reversing gravity on your arms, you're probably feeling like a little tingle. And you can like you know, get, make some fists, you can rotate your shoulders in and out, but just reaching up and really breathing and bringing some space into your spinal column is going to give you energy, right? Just a low impact, no weight bearing move. And then whenever, even after like 30 seconds or so, whenever you bring your arms back down, you're going to feel that you're going to feel it in your shoulders, probably in your forearms, but you can add some weight to it, right? And we want to change the culture of meetings so that this is actually stuff that happens in meetings. So we're just going to keep it quick. We don't even have music for you today. But Ty, why don't you show them like a little bit of weight bearing? So I'm going to, I'm just standing. Okay, I'm in a school right now. So the chairs are really small in here as an elementary. But if you have your chair, you can really just step back. I'm leaning on the back of the chair and I have my back still in a plank position as if I was on the ground. My spine is straight. I'm pulling my belly button in and I'm just keeping, I'm sorry, I'm out of the screen. It's a very small space, um, but I'm keeping my back straight, leaning forward. I can even add push-ups in here, keeping my elbows tight. And again, I can sit in a Zoom meeting and do this, you know, during, I'm not even moving anywhere. Uh, you know, and if you have the distraction of the Zoom meeting happening, you might get in a hundred before you even know it. So you could do plank from a chair. You could do, you could do it from the seated position, an elevated plank, or different things to add a little weight to that as well, too. And Susan, I think you have one more to show. One more, but I also want to emphasize that when you're even in like uh, all fours or plank, anything hands down, you want to really grip the fingers and put the weight into your fingers and maybe your knuckles, but not your wrists down here. You want to protect that carpal tunnel. And so by gripping and pressing the weight into your fingers and your knuckles, this is the yoga teacher coming out in me, you're going to lift up and relieve pressure on the wrist and that's gonna build your forearm muscles and keep that tunnel open so that you don't collapse and have carpal tunnel syndrome, which is what happens when we collapse into the wrist. So keep that in mind that even just pressing into the floor, into the fingertips is a great just meeting exercise. You can, I'm doing it right on my desk, just standing up. But then you can also take full weight by doing a half handstand against the wall or against your desk. And that's just, I can't really demonstrate and I don't want to make anybody fall on their heads. Um, but you just, you know, uh, measure one leg's distance away from the wall so that you put your feet hands where your feet were and climb your feet up the wall. And that's a safe way to put even more pressure on your hands, again, gripping into the finger pads and the knuckles here, not the wrist. So we can't see you. Do some of these things in the meeting. You'll pay even more attention. Your brain will be, um, will be flowing with blood. You'll have the rainbow brain from movement and you'll be happier because exercise creates endorphins and it builds a brain derived neurotrophic factor and DHEA, all of these important things that your brain needs. So um, having a little exercise in the middle of your meeting and in the middle of your day is a great investment 
especially if you don't have time. Ty has a toddler. I've got teenagers like we got to walk dogs and do work. Like nobody has time for long workouts all the time, right? Susan, I also want to encourage, you know, during some of your workouts, music matters. Not only is music a mindfulness thing, but adding a little music also, you know, add to the motivation, the fun behind it, you know, so choose music wisely. Maybe I see some people, like you said, in your meetings and things like that, that, you know, it helps to motivate you and keep you going and distract you a little bit as you're doing it. Totally. And in fact, in the immune boosters, we specifically put move with music as the immune booster because, and again, we, we had our Masters of Public Health students research all of this, there is actual evidence-based data that shows that music, because it boosts our joy and because it works out your entire brain, it actually boosts your immune system just like exercise does in different ways. So if you combine the two and you move with music, you're gonna bring joy, you're gonna bring exercise, it's all good. So I love what's going on in the chat. There's some great app and, uh, and benefit recommendations going on. So keep checking out the chat. And uh, there's a call for some good you know, YouTube and other movement playlists. And we've got a YouTube channel too with Gabby. We'll even kick your butt on some of the movement things we've got on our YouTube channel. And like I said, if you want any um, bilingual consejos de bienestar, we have a whole uh, series of one minute subtitled videos in Spanish and English with um, wellness advice from teachers for teachers. And we welcome you to pass those around. So let's see, we're good on time. Um, I want to make sure we get to our really discussion around team care and how do we support each other. We gave you an idea with the immune boosters, right? How you can use the pluses and the deltas to match people up. Um, and we want to talk a little bit more about this team element. So I'll start uh, as far as Google um, did a project Aristotle, which was basically looking at like, uh, why is the sum, um, you know, greater than the parts? And they found, they did a multi-year study of the most successful teams to find out what they had in common. And without going over the whole study, I just want to point out that the number one element of a successful team is psychological safety. Could the team take risks with each other? Did they have the psychological safety to do that? And so again, our point is that when we use wellness as a team building tool, we actually automatically create, or we can create, if done well, that psychological safety because we're being vulnerable in a safe way about our physical and mental health. We are sharing and building bonds of empathy with others. And that's the trust that's the risk taking, you know, that teams really depend on. So we're hopeful that because we have stressful lives and because we want to put the we back in wellness, you know, we can take more of a, a team approach in the nonprofit and the education world. This quote really resonates with me growing up, the oldest of five and playing on a lot of team sports. This quote really captures the essence of what we mean in our approach to team care. I'm going to give you a minute to take it in, breathe with it, and just read it. I really like the piece that says, there is a oneness to human humanity that we achieve our ourselves by sharing ourselves with others and caring for those around us. We want you to understand that, yes, I check in with yourself. What am I bringing to the table? Make sure you're well. But there's something powerful in the we, the collective whole, the oneness with each other. And if, and if you don't leave here with anything else, I want you to leave here with that quote, that piece. How are we bringing that one is coming together more as a society, as a culture, as a team? How are we doing this work in within the we? I'm going to let Susan take us into the next part about the we. Right. So for uh, for this next part, I'll share that we 
care a lot about taking breaks in, in our sort of curriculum, um, partially because it's a way to boost your brain and partially because it's a way to support others. And so again, self-inquiry first and self-awareness, we want to know first, how do you take breaks, right? And by some people say, well, don't call it a break because it's really, you're boosting your brain. So how do you boost your brain in the middle of a work day? Let's say, um, it might be the old world of when you were at an office. It might be the new world of working from home, but how do you take breaks? And we'd like to share some ideas in the chat. We're on a bit of a time delay. So go ahead and put them in the chat box. <clears throat> I'll share, um, I'll, I'll put my answer, which is K-pop in the chat box. And I'll share that uh, my daughter and I have been learning BTS and Mama Moo dances, which YouTube makes not easy, but easier. Walking dogs, go out onto the patio and stand in the sun, taking deep breaths. Lucky to have a dog at work every day. A lot of dog walks. Working on puzzles. Fantastic break. Um, you can even do some puzzles during meetings, right? Walking around the apartment. More dogs. Listening to audiobooks. Texting. Faraway friends. Sending funny gifts. This is what Ty and I do a lot. Gardening. Now that it's spring, we can get out. Did you know there's antidepressant chemicals in soil? So it literally helps us. And ecotherapy is a thing too. There's a quiet room. They can close their eyes and listen to music in the dark. That's amazing for overstimulation. Watering plants, getting tea. Y'all check out the chat for good break ideas. Sudoku. So these are great ideas. What we like to do is shake it up. Encourage people to take new and different breaks, right? Partially to shake up their routine, but also to introduce their brain to new stimuli. And we'll show you a bingo card that we've created for that in a second. But I wanna ask, like, how does your team encourage breaks, right? How do you encourage breaks on your team? So a couple of folks have mentioned their self practices, but how about your team? And this is what I really wanna see in the chat. So we're gonna allow a little time on this because you all can get ideas from each other about how you encourage breaks. And ironically, telling people to stop working often makes them work harder. I'm just gonna throw that out there. Ty, what, what comments do you have about our break bingo uh, while we wait for folks to put some uh, support tactics in the chat? So bingo is one of those games, it's timeless, right? It never goes away, right? And it never stops being fun. So I strongly recommend creating opportunities to bring that togetherness or not only boost your brain, but boost the team wellness, right? So we create a bingo card in, in English and in Spanish that give people different options that they can do, obviously trying to get bingo. And some workplaces we've seen, Susan, they create little gifts or wellness packages as gifts for people when they finish or when they uh, get bingo. But this can be laminated, put your initial square. It makes it fun, something to do around the job as we're increasing our wellness, right? So I'm excited about this new tool that we have. There's some great stuff in the chat, um, including 50 minute meetings. So there's always a built in 10 minute break. We like to do that with our trainings. We usually let people go early and tell them to go like do one of these things for five minutes. Don't just, you know, check their phone. Um, there's some great silliness happening because, you know, as we said in the immune boosters, laughter is a legit immune booster and team builder. Um, great way to calm your nervous system right away. So anything you can do to encourage laughter, I am always a big fan. Um, they do. There's some great ideas on the chat about game nights, monthly book clubs. Anytime Daniel Pink has a whole book called uh, When the Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing, and he talks about the science of breaks. I talk about this in my Take Five talk about taking better five minute breaks. He says, um, you know, even for introverts, like a connected break is it, like with other people is better 
because it soothes our nervous system, that social pull that we have through the vagus nerve. Um, however, you can't talk about work. That, that ruins the break. And it's not a break, then it's work. So the things that on the chat, like book clubs or game nights, you're not talking about work, you're talking about the game or the book. And that is critical to building relationships, right? And to, uh, to soothe our nervous systems. Great ideas in the chat about some wellness packages. We also, um, uh, teacher Appreciation Week is coming up. That's pretty much every week now. But we did a wellness bags, Bolsas de Bienestar, in one of our bilingual schools where we spent no more than a dollar per bag, you know, did like little immune boosters, you know, ginger, tea and candies. Um, we got some uh, donated tennis balls for foot massages you know, step on a tennis ball for a foot massage. They're easy, cheap ways you can appreciate each other. The best thing is like whatever card or quote you put inside the bag with the tennis ball, right? Um, so we're all about like getting you all to encourage each other to take different, better, shorter, awesome breaks. <laughs> so there's some great, um, the name of the Daniel Pink book is When the Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing. And um, yeah, free PTO for those bosses out there, like doesn't cost you anything, makes people so happy, right? Letting people go early, giving an extra day. Um, anyway, these aren't really breaks, but somebody's giving a plus one on Dan Pink's book. Dan Pink is a DC resident. We love his stuff. Taisha and I generally are book dorks. So what else can you do to encourage breaks? Tie in the school setting, it's particularly tough because, you know, you all have bells going off all the time. Um, but what do you do to encourage your colleagues in the, in the education world to take breaks? In, the, in my particular role, I am the person that gives the teachers the break. So <laughs> I'm in a unique situation. So I encourage the break by literally walking into their room and saying, hey, take a break. I have your class right now. So I kind of tell them to take a break. I'm in a unique situation though. Um, but one of the things I've been thinking about is that tea station you and I have been talking about, you know, what, what is it that your grandmother say? A watch pot doesn't boil. Actually it does. And if I sit and watch it, I'll actually get a mindful moment in. So that's what I, how I'm going to encourage the teachers around me to watch a pot of water boil for your tea to take that mindful break. I love it. I love it. Yeah, we we did in a medicinal tea bag uh, wellness thing with arnica, um, prop propitia echinacea, moringa, the the miracle tree. If if y'all don't know about moringa, check that out. You could t eat the powder or drink the tea. Um, and what was the final tea? Oh, valerian, which smells like dirty socks, but it's a great sleep aid. <laughs> we you know go to the international store, get a bunch of cheap medicinal teas, and make like a little medicinal tea break bag. Um, so we're spending time on this because we really think that breaks are a great way. You don't have time for a mental health webinar, you know, all of the time. We're grateful that you're here with us today. We do these all the time and they break attendance records at workplaces because people really need this stuff. But often you don't have 50 minutes for a webinar. And so we really like to, um, you know, make great webinars, but also encourage you to take little breaks, do little things throughout your day. Um, so I want to leave some time for questions. So I just thought we'd let you know what we do. We have a core stress curriculum where we always teach about brain science and interactive practices and how to bring this both to yourself for the I and the self-care, but also the we for team care. Um, and Taisha and I usually lead our core curriculum and our train the trainer sessions. And then we have a whole stable of folks that bring in different skills, um, to our workshops. Ty, do you want to mention um, anything about the skill shops? The skill shops are amazing, just FYI. It, it's a combination of different ways to feed your mind, your body, your soul. I, I, I just can't speak enough you know, joy and greatness. I particularly enjoyed the juggling session. That was a challenge for me. And he made it so easy, but you'll be surprised how much of a cardio workout you got and an arm workout you got from throwing these scarves everywhere. So some of, we have very various ranges of skill shops and it, it's just amazing and, and fun way to get a team together and meet new people actually. 
Indeed. It's fun to do new things together. Ty and I bonded over that early on uh, when I interviewed her for a video and she, and I, she was talking about bringing Pilates to a workplace, a nonprofit, very high stress workplace that was um, working with incarcerated, formerly incarcerated citizens. And she said, you know, when people sweat together, they bond, you know, it's all leveled because everybody's going through a hard thing together. And it's just great practice. You know, when you take on a new challenge, like juggling a plastic bag or, you know, doing a Qigong uh, movement or animals pose, like it's just something new you all get to do together. And it's really fun that we get to do this as our job to introduce groups who are making real differences in the world um, to these incredible evidence-based practices. So if you'd like to follow us, I know N10, did you know Taisha N10 signed off Facebook and Instagram? They are not contributing to um, the injustices perpetrated by the monopoly of Facebook. So go N10, but we actually are on Instagram. So if you, if you also are, then please follow us. And we would love to hear from you. We love uh, feedback on these sessions. Um, leave you with a short Mary Oliver poem. Uh, because that's how we make them better. One reason we didn't give you the stressor scorecard today is it's in the midst of an overhaul. It's going to be a stressor and resilience scorecard. So stay tuned for a re revamp of that. Um, and I'll stop sharing my screen so that hopefully in the time we have left, we can take some questions, but also give you a break. Like we don't, we won't be offended if you log off and go walk the dog before your next session. Um, but if you would like to, um, uh, stay on and ask questions. We are happy to take them. And don't forget to check out the collaborative team care, not self care document as well. Um, thanks for adding stuff to that. Christine says, are you doing any other workshops today? No, but we have a lot of school interviews today. So we'll be learning a lot about wellness in schools this afternoon. I actually wow. have a group of middle school kids waiting on me right now, so I'm going to head off. Great uh, great meeting all of you. Great interaction today, and I hope to see you soon. I'm going to leave the question and answer to Susan. Have a Perfect. great day, everyone. Bye, Ty. Thank you. So um, I'm happy to take any questions. Darlisa gives us the 10-minute warning. Oh, and uh, Jesse said, don't forget to fill out the evaluations. And believe me, the bingo Spanish cards, the Spanish bingo cards are way better than the English ones. We came up with new stuff and a lot of it is um, more fun than the English ones. So if, if you speak Spanish, go for the Spanish ones. <laughs> Yes, we do virtual workshops for teams. That's pretty much all we do these days. Just like this, but more fun because we can see each other. Thanks everybody. Best practices to share as we all begin to emerge from our digital lives and return to physical office spaces. Yeah, the, um, and Marco, I see the question about psychological safety on teams. I'll, I'll take that first, which is our model is to encourage folks to talk about wellness as a way to build that psychological safety. So I might feel only comfortable sharing at first, maybe something about like my eating, like, like I'm trying to eat more vegetables or more probiotic yogurt, um, because I just don't feel like talking about my exercise or like my sleep with coworkers. But eventually, as people do start sharing about sleep or about exercise, then maybe I'm like, well, you know, sometimes I walk my dog and, you know, you just share more. And as people share more on their own schedule, some people are going to share a lot. You know, those people. Some people will share on their own schedule and they become more safe. And it's, you know, for neurodiverse teams, some people are always going to be comfortable sharing and some people never will. But as long as they can still be part of the conversation, even without sharing, win-win, because they still get good ideas from listening to the conversation that other people are having. And the people who are willing to share, you know, are sort of modeling vulnerability for others and hopefully creating more psychological safety. So as we, um, oh, I unfortunately don't know much about vertigo, so I can't help on that one. Um, and then, uh, you asked about returning to physical office spaces. 
I would just encourage everyone to not go back to the old normal. Create a new normal. So your office life is different and will forever be different. So why not have different wellness practices also be part of your new normal? And that could be as simple as we take breaks now and we remind each other to take breaks and we support breaks and we encourage breaks and we give you free nuts and to eat during break, whatever it is, right? It might be a different way that you start meetings. Maybe you start with a mindful breath now. Maybe you give a new benefit to workers where they can spend $100 on whatever they want if it's wellness oriented, right? Companies do this. Companies have a $7 billion wellness program, like industry. Nonprofits don't have any of that. So we we do coaching and, and training all the time on like what your organization can do with your budget or with your workforce or with your distribution of employees. But it's because it's always different and you have to provide a buffet of options for people. But I would just encourage you as you go back to your physical workspaces, like make changes and make them permanent. We have a lot of mental health recovery to do and it will take a while and it will take new skills, new resources, not a rehash of the same stuff from before. It's a different world. So hopefully that was helpful. We get 30 minutes of paid wellness each day. Amazing. Um, take over the message for the day is what can I do to support the team? That's what you should be asking yourself because when we give, we know this in the nonprofit world, when we give, we receive, right? When we give to others, we get a hit of gratefulness and gratitude. Therefore, if we're thinking about, it's like a marriage, right? So what I hear, if you're always thinking about like, what can I do to strengthen this relationship to make this other person happier and healthier, then you are necessarily like making yourself happier and healthier too. And so sure, self-care, there's a billion people out there that will remind you to do self-care. We want to remind you team care. What are you doing for team care? How is your team supporting you? And how are you supporting your team? And if you're a manager, you've got more responsibility for that right? Thanks, everybody. Thanks for the thanks. I'm just hanging out, you know, until there's no more questions. But really, I want you to like log off and go breathe some fresh air or dig in the dirt for a second before your next session. There's another question about Oh, do you have any tips for getting buy-in from team members who are tired of hearing us tell them to breathe and take a break when they're overloaded and overwhelmed with work? The way to get buy-in from team members is to, frankly, to do what they ask, like once or twice. It, like if, if they are saying we are overloaded and overwhelmed with work, then you have to say, you're right. You are overloaded and overwhelmed with work. I'm giving you a free day off. Like you, you like listen or like I'm redistributing your workload um, because nothing else that you say, even though breathing is the best possible wellness advice you can give them of this, I am certain breathing is the best lesson they could possibly learn, but they will not learn it if they don't think you are listening to them. So listen, even though people don't actually know what they need or want, <laughs> that's, I mean, frankly, we don't know what we need. We don't know what's good for us. We want to be heard. And if I tell you that I think I know what's good for me and I think I know what I need, then I want you to listen and give it to me as a boss. Right. And then I will be like, oh, they listened. They respect me. They Maybe I should listen to them and I'll respect them. And maybe redistributing the workload isn't possible right now, but you gotta say something besides breathe and take a break, right? But some places don't even do that. So wherever you are, maybe you're at the, yes, we say breathe and take a break, but we you know, still have structural inequities at work and a lot of oppression because people cannot possibly reduce their workload. Then you're, you're gonna have, you're gonna lose people. It's built into your model already. You're, you know, you keep people for two years, then you lose them, right? That's the way we operate in the nonprofit world. Same thing with teaching. So you can either keep doing it the way you've always done it and keep losing people or listen, 
and restructure and keep people. Jarlisa says one minute left. I'll shut down. Thanks, everybody.